Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, every week I sit down with a sales leader, a business owner, and someone who's driving game-changing results in their industry. And this woman is uh, an exemplary game changer, Julie Ellis. And Julie was one of the co-founders of a Canadian company called Mabel's Labels. And most parents are probably saying, I definitely know that. They were the little labels that you put in your kids' clothes for lunch boxes. And so she created this business from her basement in Hamilton, Ontario. She grew it, she scaled it, and she sold it. And so she's here today to talk to us about what that, what that was like, that experience, kind of getting out of your comfort zone and betting on yourself. And so she's also written a book, Big Gorgeous Goals, and it's how bold women achieve great things. And so she shares a lot of insights that she she you know, she learned along her entrepreneurial path and she's still learning, but to help women get out of their head, to believe in themselves, to bet on themselves and really looking at how to scale your business. You know, what do you, how can you delegate? How can you be laser focused, um, set clear expectations so that you're managing your time, you're managing your, your processes, but also if you're looking to achieve big goals, you know, it's going to take steps. It's not like you're going to achieve them overnight. So how do you manage the processes of the steps within, but also how do you manage your mindset? How do you not get too far of yourself? How do you live in that uncertain, uncomfortable environment? Because it's, it's tough, right? And sometimes, you know, what we're looking for, it's not clear right away. And so the step that we thought was right to the left is more to the right. And so how do we navigate that? How do we surround ourselves with others who, who are, you know, can give us the support, but sometimes you know, ask us the difficult questions that force us to really dig deep and say, like, are we, is this a natural default here? Are we hiding or are we truly leaning into our discomfort, our vulnerability and trying everything we can? So I had a great conversation with Julie um, and I know you're going to take away a lot from the conversation, whether you're a female entrepreneur, a female corporate executive who's leaving or thinking about leaving and just that transition period, what goes on in our heads from really having the security and the safety to, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> betting on myself. And it's a lot. And she shares her story and how the tools and techniques and mindset that we need to adopt in order to, you know, to be bold and to achieve great things. So highly encourage uh, you take a listen, let us know what you think. And um, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. So I am delighted to be speaking with the former, one of the former owners of Canadian Mabel Labels. I would say most parents would be very familiar. I know I am with that brand. And I'm delighted to be speaking with um, author and entrepreneur, Julie Ellis. So Julie, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me today, Karen. My pleasure. Thank you for sharing what, what I know is going to be very inspiring to a lot of female entrepreneurs or, or leaders in their field of just the journey you went through from the ups and downs and I guess I, I'd like to start because not everyone knows perhaps the story of, of how you got to where you are today. And perhaps, you know, what lessons did you take from the experience um, with Mabel's Labels to now inspire and motivate other female leaders to, to set their big, gorgeous goals? Well, Mabel's Labels was an unbelievable dream, really, uh, when I think about it. Um, we started it in 2003 in a basement in Hamilton, Ontario, because we had a dream. Um, you know, we were sending our kids to daycare and they were saying, please label everything. And we were asking them how, and they suggested masking tape and a Sharpie. And we really didn't like think that was very beautiful or functional and felt like we could do a better job. And so that sent us down a path of, you know, uh, 12 years of growing that business. And um, we were, you know, up to about 40 people. 
and we had products we were selling in Walmart in Canada and Target in the United States. And then one day the phone rang and Avery Labels asked us if we'd ever thought about selling our business. Um, and so, and, and, you know, we, we had thought about the idea very peripherally, the business wasn't for sale. Um, but we knew that, you know, the next 10 years or 12 years of growing the business was going to look different than it had to get to that point. And we knew that it would mean some big changes. And so when they came in from the side, um, you know, you also have a lot of money on the table, right? I mean, it's your retirement, it's everything you have. And so, you know, it, it looked like an attractive uh, proposition. And so ultimately, we did sell the business to them. Mm -hmm. That's great. So what I'm hearing is moms with kids in daycare can be innovative as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, yes, toddlers make us innovative. <laughs> yeah, amongst other things. <laughs> yeah, that, definitely. That, that, that's fantastic just seeing that you had a dream and a better way of doing something because, you know, when you think about it, Mark, uh, you know, a Sharpie and masking tape, it's not very beautiful, but it's also not functional. No, and no, because the, the Sharpie actually comes off the masking tape in the dishwasher. And so that durability factor was something that we really wanted to focus on. And, you know, I think one of the things about Mabel's Labels it, is that it was a 12-year climb. Like, we were climbing a mountain to a pinnacle, uh, which turned out to be selling the business. I don't think we fully knew what the pinnacle was, but we wanted it to be big. And we just kept doing things where people were like, oh, I don't think you can do that. And we were like, okay, well, we, we, we think we can, so watch us. Um, and we just kept doing, kept doing, you know, well, we have an idea for a product that will do this, that will stay put in shoes. Oh, shoes, that's really hard. Um, and we just kept, kept going on our way, you know, and part of that was, you know, building our own software that ran the business in the back end. Part of that was um, selling, making a new product, going to China and getting it made and selling it at Walmart. But, you know, things that things that we had really no business doing, um, but we did them because we believed in what we were doing and we uh, thought we could figure it out and be successful. Mm -hmm. Well, you did. So we did. <laughs> forget, remove, remove the thought. You you did, and it sounds like just you know every challenge that you thought of, you overcame it immediately. So there was a perhaps an, an ounce of self doubt, but then and it it sounds like because there's a group of you, maybe one was a little bit more overzealous than the other, and then that carried the group forward. If there's any doubting Thomases, they'd be squashed pretty quick. I would say yes to that from time to time. But I would also say it wasn't just always overnight, right? Like it's easy to look at, you know, it's easy to look at it and be like, wow, they exited, they sold, like what an overnight success. Well, it was 12, it was 12 years of hard work, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's also the like, you know, public outside image that the world sees. And then there is the sort of hard work and, and climb and, you know, feeling frustrated because we didn't know what we were doing and how would we learn and all of the pieces that go into any success story. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot. I feel that a lot of people just see that finished product and it's glamorous from the outside looking in. But what they don't see is the grueling setbacks, the failures, the, but the learnings alongside of them. And so they're maybe quick to judge and that, oh, you guys were lucky or, you know, it just came easy to you. And you think, well, 12 years is a long time. And, you know, to, to get there took so many left and right turns and sometimes turns down an avenue that cost you. And I, you know, for me, I've made mistakes as well, but like money, time, bad investments, but you know, and the, you learn from them and then you make a better decision the next time. Yeah, absolutely. And it is just that piece of, you know, it's like an iceberg and, and, um, it's so that's my, that's my, it, it's a funny analogy, but I always used to, you know, tell my kids when they were little, like, you know, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. And, and to me, that's kind of like what this iceberg analogy is. It's this 10% that sits above the water of any iceberg and 90% of it is below. And, and the 10% above is, you know, the amazing things you see that people do. But the 90% is the blood, sweat and tears and the, you know, failure and the, you know, hundred ways you tried to get there and all of the things that went into that success, mm -hmm. um, the people that sustain you, the systems you built, like all of those things are the unseen work. 
Yeah, totally. And I would also say even that 10%, sometimes as we're entering, say we're leaving the corporate world and we're going on our own, what they see is this real confident, you know, a sort of woman. And, and that might be a facade initially because the 90% underneath is quivering going, holy cow, what did I just do? But I think it's, it's you fake it until you become it. And so it's like, yes, I, I, I can look like this, but underneath, man, it's like the duck, you know, it looks like it's, it's uh, coasting smoothly through the water, but underneath the feet are going a mile a minute. So I, I just think that 10% as well can be applied to the different ways along the journey, especially for women who have perhaps left a safe environment to embark on a new adventure of their own. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the, there's that piece of it. And, you know, the after of any situation can always be difficult. I mean, we climbed for 12 years and after we sold the business and I left, um, you know, that, that's a serious plateau to sit on, right? After a huge success, because, you know, you reach the entrepreneurial dream, you sell your business, you have an exit, you create an exit for yourself. And so you join this, you know, club, so to speak. I mean, it's not a real club, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and, um, you know, but at the same time, I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, I didn't know how to not climb. I didn't know how to sit on a plateau and um, contemplate what to do next or enjoy that time, particularly. Like I had a fun summer. And then once summer ended, I got quite stuck in um, what to do next. And, you know, and, and then this like irrational, the irrational fears of, well, what if the best thing I ever did is in the rearview mirror? What if I'm like some washed up entrepreneur? You know, the stories you start to tell yourself are not helpful and not true. And, but they stick you in a bad place. Yeah. And, and I've talked to a lot of people and they say, you know, when they hit that pinnacle, whatever it is, whether it's a revenue dollar amount, whether it's a status, a, you know, number of followers, but a lot of times when they say when, when they actually got there, was it everything they imagined? And, and it's not. Yeah. No. And so, so I can imagine having that work ethic and just almost knowing like in September, you have that back to school feel where you're back to the grind and that's gone. I would imagine part of your identity might've been gone as well. It definitely was. It definitely was. And I got really trapped at the sort of this crossroads of grief and gratitude because I needed some time to grieve the business that I had loved so dearly. And that no matter what, whether I had stayed or whether I had left, I still, that grieving process still needed to happen because the business was never the same, right? As anything would be. I mean, you get a new owner with new ideas with new directions to take the business in, like what we had was gone. And so I needed to grieve that whether I was still there or whether I'd gone. But I didn't know how to tell people I was grieving it without looking ungrateful for the fact that we'd been able to exit. And that tied me up for quite a long time, um, not being able to talk about it because I was so afraid of looking ungrateful and I did not want to look ungrateful. Um, so it, it was a journey in that respect. But once I figured out that piece, like set, talking about that piece and telling people that I struggled, I was so shocked at how it resonated with them mm -hmm. and how understandable it was and how, yeah. And so then really I started talking about it more and more. <laughs> so vulnerability for the win vulnerability for the win <laughs> for sure for sure right and and to you know people telling people you struggle is you know everybody does so it, it's it's very relatable yeah I think that's the big thing these days is that we want to be relatable but you know there's a there's almost a, a paradox I, first of all I love the word I, I love that relationship grief and gratitude because I think you know a lot of people have this persona or this image that I have to know everything. And even for you getting off the sale, like I have to be grateful, but you, you can't, I would imagine you can't move forward and you can't be open to more until you mourn and let go of the grief. But you also want to share it because along that journey, I imagine you're helping other people in similar si grieving situations. Yeah. Yes. And it is, yeah, you've got to, you've got to find a way to move through it. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, when you go on a really great vacation for two or three weeks and the, you know, a couple of days before you go back, you're like, oh, 
I, I don't really want this to end. Like, I don't want to go back to work. Even when you love your job, you sometimes yeah. feel like, oh, I don't want to go back to work. It was that like times 10, right? So the feeling of how you get yourself out of that and try something and do something was there was a lot of resistance for for finding it to move forward. And the more time that went on, the more resistance that was there, because I feel like the more expectations that I had of myself of mm -hmm. where I wanted to go and which were totally founded in nothing and not realistic. Yeah. And so what would you say for others, Julie, who are maybe stuck in that moment and can't let go and like in that maybe dark, heavy place, like what, what are some ways that you, helped you get out of them? Um, so some of it was about being kind to myself, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being gentle, like, like my coach always used to say to me, Julie, you don't have to do everything the hard way. And so because, you know, I, I, I like to sort of grind things out and, and that's part of my personality and I needed to be kinder to myself and be more gentle with myself and really look at things like I was experimenting, right? Like give myself permission to go out and conduct some experiments and to succeed sometimes and fail sometimes as I figured out where I was going to go next. Mm -hmm. And, and that wasn't, you know, nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to say, I'm going to go do some stuff and I'm going to fail at some of it. And I, I'm going to learn a lot and it's going to be amazing. Like that, that's not typically, you know, we were, I was always like, the stakes are high. We got to win and we're going to figure out how to do it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, giving myself that kind of permission, that sort of gentleness and uh, it, it'll let me try things. Mm hmm and was that out of character for you, Julie, that gentle, yeah, for your, because you, you sound like a real type A go-getter, and then all of a sudden, oh, I have to <laughs> caress myself and be gentle, might not be, might not be the, the natural approach. No, no, it's definitely not my natural approach, right? Like, I'm, like, set a big goal, and let's climb that mountain. Yeah. Um, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time. You know, like that's my, like, I get really excited about it and motivated by it. And so, you know, part of that was, and I think part of it also was figuring out how to sort of carve my own path, right? Like when you have co-founders, somebody's always down, but somebody else is always up. Right. So, so there's the dynamic of people who are like picking you up off the floor and pulling you along for a while, maybe, and then you pull them for a while. And, you know, there's that sort of shared dynamic, but thinking mm -hmm. about doing it on your own is quite different also. And that, um, like I, I've always been fairly self-motivated. Like I can make myself a great to-do list and, but you know, you really realize what your um, like defaults are. And, and I talk about that a lot in the book, like the default of, you know, um, ending up with to-do list goals because, you know, you can make a really great list and you can start checking things off, but, but that's where you start playing it safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're definitely going to get into that. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something because you had co-founders. So would you suggest for people who are solopreneurs to perhaps find a network of people like them to have that support, have that sense of community to get them out of their heads so that they're not so, you know, hard on themselves and only coming at it from, from one angle? Yeah, I think that's one of the things, even with co-founders, it's one of, it's a lonely career choice to be an entrepreneur. And so you've got to find ways and it's like a constant cycle of learning. Like, you know, in the beginning, you don't have the money to hire people for their expertise. So you have to figure it out. And even once you have the money, like you need people that have really broad skills and you're building things, you know, nothing about, like there's a real learning curve a lot of the time, you know, suddenly you had an idea and you started a business and suddenly you have 40 people that work for you. Like, you know, like those are, those are real things that you might've never anticipated. So it's that constant learning mm -hmm. and growing curve for sure. Yeah. I, and you know, I can say I, I'm in it. I, it, cause I'm always learning and I'm always <laughs> in the uncomfortable phase, but it doesn't bother me. I'm just so accustomed to throwing myself in way over my head and figuring it out. And I love it. I, because I don't play safe. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? So it's like not getting so consumed with, I mean, people talk about working in your business and working on your business. And, and it's a little bit like that for me, but it's more about like, 
are you just making yourself so busy and your to-do list is so mm -hmm. long that you're not doing the pull back lift out like what's the really big thing that i want to go after right so you get stuck with a clean inbox and you know uh like like i i'm actually feel like okay my inbox i'm a few days behind on my email okay i'm probably working on the right stuff like uh, you know yes. like like when i'm not super super tight on everything and there's a few loose ends that's actually uncomfortable for me because i like to be you know viewed as being reliable and trustworthy and all of those things but the truth is that when i have a few little not the, i'm not dropping the big stuff but i'm dropping some of the small stuff and and you know the balls are falling down a little bit and that's where i'm like okay so i'm i've got these big dreams that are like out here that i'm figuring out how to turn them into goals and how to chase them mm -hmm. i love that and, and i feel that when people are doing all these little behind the scenes they're in motion and, and it's almost that like they're hiding a bit behind all this busyness but it's actually not producing revenue generating results or getting you closer to those goals because you're not in action yes yeah you get you get stuck a little bit right and you get stuck in your own sense of comfort i mean we all like things mm -hmm. to be comfortable and not easy but kind of easy like like just comfortable and familiar feels good right and so when you're constantly on that sort of leading edge it, it's not comfortable or familiar necessarily and so you know how much time can you spend there and and it's so it's finding a way to like yeah keep pushing the edge keep pushing it farther and also to you know have a balance of obviously we all have to get things done right? Like, you know, you can't, you can't spend all your time in one side or the other. So you have to find a way to balance it. So what compelled you then? We're going to switch gears a little bit to write big, gorgeous goals. Was there, um, has it always been a dream to, to write a book or what kind of was that point where you're like, I want to share this, my story with others, with the world? Yeah. So I've never, I've never really been a writer, it was never part of my, you know, role to, you know, write blogs, marketing, none of that was part of sort of the jobs that I've done. And so what really happened was I, I started telling, well, when I met you um, and we were doing, you know, the Beyond Boundaries program for an accelerator for women entrepreneurs, and I was the growth uh, mentor. And I started literally telling my story there. And it really, I got a lot of feedback, a lot of really good feedback about how it landed for people. And then from there, I, you know, after telling the story quite a few times, I wrote a keynote. And then from the keynote, I was sort of backed into writing a book because what I realized as a keynote came to life was there was actually so much more to tell that you're, you know, not going to necessarily talk about in a keynote. And the place where I felt there was a huge opportunity was really in that like 90% of the iceberg where it's like systems processes and people and how do you put those together to kind of get you where you want to go yeah that's amazing and so looking at the book um who would you say this this is for would it be for all women leaders women entrepreneurs or like what's that target group that you that would really resonate with your story because i can tell you when you shared the story and i was i was in the audience and when you went to china i could see it i could visualize it and I, I feel that what why most people related is because you were so out of your comfort zone, but you you did it anyway. And so I felt that after that, it, it might not have been as bold as going to China, but maybe it was, you know, buying a CRM or just, you know, going into a, a different avenue that was out of their comfort zone. But you gave them the, the confidence to go, well, if, I, if it's possible for one, it's possible for many. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. Like it's everybody's sort of... Um leading edge is going to be different right like everybody's big goals so depending how experienced you are in setting big goals and doing big things your big gorgeous goal might look different they will all look different because people have are bringing different experiences to the table what does pushing the envelope look like for you so you know there's no formula in that respect of judging who's is bigger than anybody else's what there is is that i think you're in the right territory when you feel uh fairly intimidated fairly scared and you're missing some kind some ingredient that you need to 
actually achieve that goal. So that ingredient could be money. It could be a connection that you need to help you do something. It could be a skill you have know nothing about, but you're going to have to either learn or acquire in order to achieve the goal. So it's like there's some big component of actually getting there that's missing. And that to me is a real difference of setting a big, gorgeous goal. Mm -hmm. Well, because just what I'm hearing, because it's not easy then there's, there's missing pieces that you have to go out. And I imagine as you're going out to source them to upscale yourself, there's a learning component too. And even that recognition of, I don't have all the answers, but I have to go and seek them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Part of, part of it is about exploration for sure. Um, And part of it is about, yeah, like acquisition of knowledge or things or um, the money you need to do something or all of those kinds of things. Um, And it's got, you've got to be outside of where you're very comfortable and, you know, or, and or scared <laughs> yeah. by, by what it is that you want to do. But I think that's good because it's just, it's almost like, I just, I'm thinking now like a game. It's like, what do I need to complete this? Like I'll go here, I'll do this, I'll source this. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning as I go. And there's almost a hunger to go like, I got to get this to, because I w- as you, as you get these things, that's for me, confidence is a skill, right? I'm learning. That was really hard, but it didn't kill me. So what can I how can I take that now and apply it to the next thing that I need to source? Yes, that's absolutely it. And then how can you learn some like fundamental underpinnings that help you? Like one of the things that we talk about a lot, I talk about with clients and, you know, is this, how do I, how, and, and people of all levels struggle, but how do you effectively delegate? Mm-hmm. How do you give somebody a project And at the end, when they come back and they're super proud of themselves and like excited to show you what they did, that it's actually what you wanted, right? How many times does that happen? You give somebody a project and they come back and they're like, so excited and they deliver a presentation. You're like, ah, that's not what I asked for. (laughs) And, And often it's because the communication on the front end and setting of the expectations was not effective. Yeah. And so then the natural inclination is, well, I can't, I can't do that. I'll, I'll, I'll just do it myself mm-hmm. because then it'll be the way I want. And that is not the a scalable answer, no. right? You have to learn how to leverage down the, down the line through your team, through the people you hire to help you with things, all of those things. Because if you don't, you know, do go through that, let it go. Um, you limit yourself, right? You're, you're a constrained resource. So how do you, you know, create the kind of leverage in order to get done what you want to? Mm-hmm. And just when you were sharing that, I wrote down setting expectations because I talked about this all the time. I said that the number one thing in life, like if there's anything to blame or you've been let down, it's usually because clear expectations weren't set. Yep. Right. Yep. And you didn't give that opportunity to ensure understanding, you know, the like, all right, tell me what you think you heard here. Kind of those conversations. Right. It's funny. I remember listening to this thing about Taco Bell and totally off topic, but they added a step to their process where after they ordered, they repeated the order back to them. And oh, my God, they cut down on mistakes by like 90 percent. And so I just think it's that recap because perception, the way I perceived it could be completely different from what you actually intended to share. And so, yeah, I get clarity before, especially a big project that there's, there's ramifications if it goes off, you know, over budget, over time, you're producing the wrong thing. Like you, you can't unring that bell. Yeah, no. And it happens, you know, and that's where, you know, if it's a task, you know, can you, do you outline it properly? Do you need checkpoints? Maybe not, Mm -hmm. but the bigger it gets, the more checkpoints and the more sort of structure you want to put around that because Mm -hmm. it's also frustrating, like your team, you know, you give some them something to do and they don't come back with what you want and you send them back to the drawing board. Like that's not motivating for anybody. No. Yeah. Um, And so I think those kinds of things and, you know, how do you, how do you build good decision-making skills? How do you, do you have, can you articulate how you make decisions? And, you know, with that, can you, you know, not making a decision is also a decision, right? Mm-hmm. 
you know, and, and people are watching you to take leadership and step out and make sure things keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think everything that we're looking at within ourselves, we also have to look at within our prospects. So like, how do they make a decision? What is that criteria? How do they, are they setting clear expectations? So we are modeling the behavior, but it's also what we're attracting in terms of potential clients. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when you just said leverage before, what I see is a lot of women feel, you know, when they're in demand and they're pulled, but it's only one like this and they're just burnt out and they're overworked. And so there's a reluctance to delegate, to bring on people and to leverage. And there's, you know, without that, there's, there's no scalability. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. And I think, I think, especially when you're building something, um, where, where, and maybe it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm correcting myself as I speak, when you're building something, no matter how big you are, when you need to make that next hire, or, you know, say, uh, when you're on your own, making that, you know, hire that you don't actually have the money for yet. Mm -hmm. Or when you're building a company, and you need to hire somebody who feels very expensive but you really need the skill set to get to that next step. I, and again, you don't have the money. I mean, the theme is doing something before you don't have the money, no matter what size you're at. Like that all feels so scary, but those are leaps that, you know, you have to take at some point. And, you know, so how do you mitigate it? I know we used to have conversations a lot around the table of, okay, so we're going to have to pay them 75 grand next year, but we don't have to have the money now. Mm -hmm. You know, do we know we can get the money so that every month we have enough money to pay their paycheck? Is it a three month investment before we think we can start to see the difference? Like, what does that actually look like? And I'm just kind of a big fan of trying to do a little bit of napkin math, you know, where you pull out a napkin and a pen and you try to, so what does that look like? Okay, well, three months worth of salary. Okay, so how much do we need to have? Well, you know, we need, you know, a few thousand to pay for that. Okay, mm -hmm. we can do that. And here's where we'll have to make a decision of are things going the way we need them to? Here's the forecast, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I see that a lot of my business is that chicken or the egg, right? And it's like, I need, I need that person to take me to the next step, but yet I don't have the money to pay for it. But just with what you said there, the minute you, you pull the trigger, that propels you to make those tough decisions because you're saying, well, I need to make this money. So I think you get more decisive and you just get more laser focused because you don't have the buffer. So there's no hem hemming and hawing. It's like, we need to do this. It's right for the business. I've done my due diligence. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, what's the cost of not going right? Like the cost yes. probably is that you're stuck where you are even regret the, the emotional of just that. Not, I think that's people's biggest fear is like, not living the dream or not executing on what you secretly know you're capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing I remember hearing in a conference and um, they were just always saying like, don't look at what it's going to cost you, but look at what you're going to make, look at what it's going to allow you to make. And I, I think people that's that scarcity mindset. It's just like, it's going to cost me, you know, this much a month or whatever, but like flip the script and say like, but I now have a marketing person or I have an in-house operations. I can do this in like half the time I could before. What does that mean for my business? Where can I bridge those gaps that were gaps before? And so I think it's about just looking, taking a different angle to look at it from. Yeah. Yeah. And then what can you, you know, get from that? Like, is it, yeah, you're trying to build your own business. So you, your, your time is the money that you need to grow it more. So if you free up your time, you have mm -hmm. more money. Is it that you free yourself up to, you know, plan the next product that will grow you or the next piece of software or the next, you know, like, what is it? What is the value to the business of freeing yourself up? Mm -hmm. And that's for me, the $5 an hour versus 500 an hour, an hour jobs. And a lot of women that I see, they want to do everything because they, their identity is attached to it. But I'm like, that is not a good use of your time. If you are the face of the business, you need to be out there selling or on podcasts or getting your visibility out there, not doing these little meaningless, meaningless tasks that you could get, you know, a fiver or, um, a, you know, some third party to do. It's just not, not a good use of your time. No, no. And that's a hard uh, transition, right? Like getting into the right sort of mind space about that. And sometimes I think it's hard for entrepreneurs because sometimes 
uh, like, like the idea of, I never wanted to manage people. And suddenly I've grown this business that has, you know, 15 people or 20 people working for it and all. Right. And so mm-hmm. figuring out, you know, then figuring out, well, what's the next thing, right? Because, you know, it's so it's your business. And sometimes people don't want to, you know, step away from being at the head of the business. So figuring out what you really want is, 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 you know, a challenge and changes as the businesses grow and change. Mm-hmm. And, and I think also it's, we have to bet on ourselves and know that like all our chips are in on us that when we feel that, yeah, we didn't sign up for managing a team or we didn't sign up for this, but, but we have to do it now. And so how can we just say like, I'm going to get the first employee bef- maybe a little bit before I'm ready, but it's because I bet on myself. And that for me is where that self belief and self worth and the mindset comes in. And it's so important especially, you know, people like I need this tool, I need this skill. And I'm like, if you don't believe up here, you don't need anything because you're dead in the water right from the get go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly true. And so it's figuring out, you know, how can you, how much risk are you comfortable with? And how much of a safe base do you have to need to build yourself to, to there for, you know, it's like fishing then, right? You got a nice little rock to stand on. There's your safe base. And then you just start casting the rod, right? Looking for what it is you're after. And so, you know, how, how heavy the little weight is on there and how far you can go and all of those things, you know, then is up to you. But it's figuring out yeah, how much risk you're willing to take and what feels like risk to you and, and really deciding to just, you know, you have to decide to go for it which on some level is taking a risk and it just will depend on where your comfort zone lies on how big you think that is and what kind of risk you're taking. Mm -hmm. And would you suggest Julie starting, you know, in terms of risk tolerance, starting smaller and then just start adding and adding to kind of build up that comfort or what, what would your thoughts be on managing risk? I think it depends on what you're up for in terms of investment and that sort of thing. But yeah, like I always, I'm a big fan of making a plan and figuring out what you need to get to that plan and then figuring out how you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like for a solo person, it could be like, you know, you want to get your revenue up here. That means you're going to need to make your first hire. That means it's going to happen at this time. And that means, you know, you're, you've got to save up some money. You've got to invest some money. You've got, you'll have the money. Like I'm, I'm a fan of facts when it comes to like, just knowing where you're going to end up with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a giant spreadsheet. Like that's my now, you know, get out a little piece of paper and do some math and figure it out. But that's prescriptive. And that for me, you can't achieve that when you're working in the business. So what would you say, Julie, when people are writing their goals? And are these, are these goals any time of the year? Are these also goals that you can do at the beginning of the year? What, what can this be used for all types of goals? Yes, all types. Uh, I think there's no time like, I mean, well, here we are. It's almost the beginning of the year. So there's a natural place here. Um, I personally find myself more attached to goal setting. It's back to school time in September for some reason. So, but you know, you need to sit down in April because everything that was on your list is sort of coming to fruition and you need to set the next set of goals. Go for it. Um, I'm a big fan of a few things. One is you need to clear some time on your calendar and get away from your like laptop desk, regular environment and go somewhere where you have some amount of like you need some kind of white space so you know i i love going on a plane and i find it very hard to actually do anything when i fly because i like to sit in a window seat and look out and that (laughs) is like time when my mind is like i'm inspired by that um i'm also like you know obviously can't go on a plane every week so I, you know, am inspired also like get out into the forest or into nature somehow and go for a walk. Use a notebook to write some things, right? Like, you know, kind of get off the like grid of my distractions. And so some people, you know, can can still use a tablet or whatever to record stuff, but I need to get back to some paper. Even if I later put in an electronic system, I need mm-hmm. to get to some paper to like actually do the like dumping of ideas. Um, and then, yeah, figure out <clears throat> how to set goals from there. 
And then, you know, one of the women I interviewed in my book, um, Diana Bishop talked a lot about, um, she's got, she creates a date with herself once a quarter. She leaves all her electronics at home. She goes to a coffee shop with her notebook and she evaluates. Here's what I did, said I was going to do. Here's what I did. Did the outcome match up? You know, did I get to where I wanted? What did the outcome? What are the next steps? And kind of does that look at, okay, there was the big goal. There's where I started. How am I doing? Mm -hmm. Because that's as important as um, anything. Because I also think with big, gorgeous goals, because they're a little bit um, amorphous, like they're not fully necessarily, there's pieces of them that you're still figuring out. What can happen is, it's not really about the destination. It's about the journey, right? So the destination may change because you're chasing something quite big. And so it's not necessarily fully defined in the beginning and it will continue to get clear as you continue to get closer to it. But that can mean, you know, you need to make adjustments and course correction because there's no point in holding the principle of no, I said I was going there. If Mm -hmm. that place, if that goal and that place don't serve you anymore. Yeah. So it's also about having a mechanism for that course correction and evaluation of how you're doing. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. Even just that decision making and, and even what's what's congruent with your value system and saying like, yes, I initially I did say that, but also being agile enough to go. But that's, you know, be careful what you wish for, because I thought that that was it, but it's actually not. Yeah. Or on the other side of that coin being like, no, I actually really want this goal. And there's some things I'm going to have to reconcile that I might not have felt comfortable doing. And I'm not saying like crossing the moral line, but more things like, oh, I'm gonna have to do some self-promotion and I really don't like doing that. Or I'm gonna have to you know, position myself in the market in a certain way that I didn't really wanna step out. Like, like those kinds of things, you know, where you have your internal resistance to them. You know, you've gotta, you know, if you really want something, you're gonna end up in that, the zone of discomfort. Yeah, no, for sure. And with what you said about the journey, you know, how important is developing consistency within that journey? I think it's important to have a consistent process around checking in with how things are going and also um, with, you know, creating time and space in your calendar to, you know, actually work on this stuff, right? Like, because, you know, it's the, it's the, you'll go to your default. So is your default, like my default would be going to like organizing my office, cleaning up my inbox, um, you know, crushing through a to-do list and not taking the time to think big. There's other people who could think big all day long and putting the systems in place to actually get to execution is where they need to actually spend their time, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and the interesting thing that I found in all the people I interviewed for the book um, there was a large amount of alignment, whether they were a person who came at it from the big, big ideas or a person who came at it from the systems processes and to-do lists that both parts are necessary for success. So it just depends where you sit in that sort of spectrum about what you'll need to do in order to find it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's important just to recognize that everyone does have their natural default. And, um, and I think that's where, was it Diane, you mentioned Diane Bishop? Diana. Yeah. Diana. Diana. And, And how important that reflection period is, because I think a lot of it is, you know, yes, this is where we, our destination was, this is where we were. But I think in that middle, the bridge is, it's important to also look and why did we not achieve that? Like, was it something within our control and really looking inward to go, that was uncomfortable. So I didn't do it. Or maybe my default kicked in versus like, we have to own the good and the bad. And sometimes we're just so quick to say, Oh, it didn't work. And they didn't get back to me. And it's like, hang on a minute. You are, you're clenching like a little girl in there, like your inner child, because you're not comfortable to come out. And so part of that, it's not abandon it. It's we need to isolate and work on that. Yes. Yep. And figure out, and I I mean, I'm a big fan of bringing people around you, you know, also to, to do it. Like, you know, are you in a mastermind? Do you have mentors? Do you have paid advisors? Do you have, you know, I've got a really great group of friends who, 
you know, will definitely build me up when they think I'm onto something. And they will also be like, oh, I'm not so sure about this one, Julie. And so, and, you know, so you do need that, right? Mm Mm-hmm. You need to build, and and maybe you need some of them, maybe you need all of them, but in some way, you've got to have people who are sounding boards, who are supporters, who cheer you on, who ask you tough questions about what it is you're trying to do. Like, all of those pieces are super important, and I think no one can do all of it as, as an island. You need other people along for the ride. Yeah. Absolutely. I would totally agree with that. And um, I think those tough questions are important because it forces you. Sometimes we, we, you know, we're drawn by emotion or we just always talked about the same story. But when someone really challenges you because they want the best for you and it forces you to let go of perhaps a story or an idea that it's not going to work, but someone sees something else within you and they push you in a good way and they they keep that pressure on. That's going to, you know, it's going to allow you to move past it or perhaps come up with a different idea. So I think if you don't have that external pressure in a good way, um, you get caught up in your head and you're just, you're not moving forward. You're stuck and your business unfortunately fails. Yeah, no, I definitely think that having people who challenge you is a huge part of, of a necessary process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you do need that place where, you know, and you do, I mean, there's a, there's a time for challenging and there's a time where you're like, okay, I hadn't thought of that. And mm-hmm. you go boop, 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 boop. Yeah. No, no, I'm good actually. And there will be people who are like, Oh, I you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand why that's what you want to go after, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's, you know, and because there's like the fine, it's all fine lines, right? Like the fine line of not following something because somebody else doesn't think it's a good idea. And, you know, there being the I told you so moment later (laughs) on either side, right, of like wild success or, okay, maybe you were right. But but what is that, you know, how do you gather that sort of feedback? How do you and then how do you use it to propel yourself forward? Mm -hmm. But and and I love that. And just what you said, there's a saying there that you would you never accept criticism from someone who you also wouldn't accept advice from. And I think that's so important because a lot of women, they're asking somebody who has no you know experience in their world and they're seeking external validation. And, and maybe that person says, no, it's not a good idea, whether it's a sister, a friend, a colleague. And it's like, and it crushes them. And you're like, and then maybe they'll stop pursuing that dream. And I think this is your dream. Like you're the only one that knows this as, as well as you do. And so I just see like, why are you giving people air? It's that quote that Brene Brown says about people in the grandstand. Like if you're not in the ring, your voice is not welcome here. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So how do you, how do you build a network of people who, who are in the ring, who've been in the ring, who want to get in the ring with you and who will then give you, um, you know, some pretty honest feedback for the good and Mm -hmm. for the maybe not so good. Yeah. Absolutely. So coming up to the end of the year now, Julie, if we get tactical, what are, what are ways or what are maybe a few things people should do? I know you mentioned the, you know, getting outside of your day to day, creating some white space, whether it's in nature to really, um, you know, remove yourself from distractions. And I think just have a clean an open canvas to deal with. Is there anything else we should be doing? And is there anything that you would suggest we be mindful of or stay away from when it comes to setting our goals? I think to be mindful of, you know, you're setting your goals. They're not being set for you. They're not, you know, and so what is it you really want? Trying, trying to get in touch with what it is you really want and, you know, what goals come out of that and, you know, knowing that you're going to continue to push yourself. And, Mm -hmm. and I think also keeping in mind, it might not be as defined as you want it to be, but can you figure out what the first few steps are that you want to take towards figuring out the next piece? Mm Mm-hmm. I, I love that because I think sometimes if it is a big one, like you mentioned, the first few steps are, they're not clear. Like there's one here, there's one way over left, but just giving yourself some grace to say, let me figure this out. But then as you go through it, the steps become a little bit more clear, but I think kind of leaning into that discomfort and it's scattered and it's muddled, but that's okay. That, that, that forces you, I think it, it forces you to make a decision. Do I still want this? And the harder it is, and the more you hang into it, you're like, this is worth fighting for. Yes. And it feels like, you know, you put your head down and you try and take those first few steps and that takes you 
off feeling as scared about how big it might be and, mm-hmm. and puts you down. And then, you know, you can, you can like put your head back up and say, okay, did the first few steps. Oh, okay. Here's what I learned. Yes. I'm in the right track or no, I want to make a few adjustments. And then, and then, you know, you put your head down and take the next few steps. And so, I mean, that's how anything gets done, mm-hmm. you know? And I, and I, you know, I'm not saying you don't need a to-do list, a good to-do list to, to get to your big, gorgeous goals. But I think you've got to throw away the to-do list to get to the big, gorgeous goal. And then you got to come back down to the practical steps. Mm-hmm. And, and I love what you said, just almost like a mountain, like mini summits so that you're breaking them into bite-sized digestible pieces that allow you to almost go through that reflective analysis what did I learn so that you're not carrying, like you're letting go of things that are not going to serve you as you continue to climb the mountain or achieve your goals. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, and how do you spend some time like sitting in a place where you're like, okay, I'm visualizing it's, it's happened. I did it. What does that look like? You know, and, and how does that help you keep going? Mm -hmm. And And some people do that. I do. I do. I found some people do it very naturally. Mm -hmm. And other people do not. So, Mm -hmm. but I do, I visualize, okay, what does that look like? What's it going to be like when I'm there? What color is the grass? What color, like, like literally I'll go through and and like actually put a bunch of detail around it. Because Mm -hmm. once I've, I've gone through that process, I'm like, okay, I'm a little bit stuck. Let's, let's, what is the prize? What is What's it like when I get there? Okay. So let's rewind. Let's feel more inspired and let's figure out what the next few steps are. Hmm. So as you're seeing it, you're kind of trying it on that when you get detracted, you can go back to that picture that you've created your mind's eye to say, okay, I can I like almost getting that you're inhaling it again to go, okay, I can see it. I can, I can, I'm back on track. Yep. Yep. Yeah. How do you get, how do you get to a place where you believe in it again? Yeah. Right. And- yeah. And I would say you're going up ebbs and flows, right? We all know it's a journey and we have good days that are really positive and up. And then there's days we get in our head. And even as experienced as we are, sometimes we are we're human as well, too. <laughs> I can say I don't have every amazing day and I can get myself out of it pretty quickly. But, you know, I think it's important to recognize why did this, why did I bite there? Like I know better, you know, and just like, am I tired? Exactly. Am, I, or am I pulled too thin? But why did I fall for that? That was a rookie mistake. And I've, I've been burned down there before. So I think it's just also checking in with ourselves and saying like, well, why am I doing these great things? Like even alternatively, like, why did I make these really good decisions? And I was, just, you know, what's, what am I doing differently here that I can, you know, continue and double down on? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it is, it's a constant, um, like not minute to minute process, but it's an ongoing process, right? Mm-hmm. Of of that sorting and that, you know, figuring out, okay, no, more of this, less of that. Let's keep going. Here's the next steps. Like, because you're talking about things you're not going to do in a week or a month, or maybe not even in a year, mm-hmm. you know, this could be something that, that you're going to work on for five years. So, you know, what are the, what are the, you know, and how do you sort of, um, reward yourself on the way. Mm. You know, what are the points where you're like, oh, like this, it's, it's coming together and we're, you know, it's happening. And, and so, you know, how do you find those mini places where you, you know, can pat yourself on the back and get excited about the next leg of the journey? And how many women do you say could work harder on rewarding themselves and giving them the pat on the back? All of us, we can all do that, I think, because I think there's such an inclination to go, oh, I know, like, a, you know, that went really well, but it's the mm-hmm. buts that kill us, right? Like, you know, we can't, you know, say, just say thank you or, you know, that sort of thing. So I mm-hmm. definitely think there's something to that. Yeah, 100%. And even just, I always say, like, look at instead of where always we're going, look at where we came from. And if you look back to your three, you know, three years ago and to where you are today, your former self would be like, man, you're doing okay. But we're always looking at what we don't have and that void and that kind of cup half empty. And it's like, well, look at where you were. Yeah. And I mean, you level up into like new arenas, new playing fields, and you're, you know, suddenly feel like the small fish again. Right. I mean, that's the one, you know, I wrote this book and suddenly I'm talking to authors like every day. I'm talking to people who wrote books, the people that I know, 
have all written books. The people that, you know, and some of them landed on, you know, big bestseller lists or big this or big that. And, and so there's a constant battle with that feeling of the imposter, right? The feeling of, you know, so now here I am in this new arena where everybody has a book and you lose perspective of, no, not everybody has a book. And it actually is an achievement to be really proud of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of those pieces that go with that, right? But you lose that perspective of, and so you have to just listen too, right? You have to listen to what people say and you have to, you know, turn off the chatter of your own mind and find ways to do that because it's so important to, you know, realize, hey, I made it to this arena. I wrote a book. I get to talk to people who wrote books. Like what an amazing opportunity that is. Um, but it don't diminish my own achievement in that, right? Yeah. 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 No, and I think it's you're gonna change. Like you're at it's almost like you remember in elementary school you go to grade eight and you're at the top of the class, the top of the school, and then you start and you're in grade nine, you're at the bottom. But I think that's good to do that because that's showing you're growing, right? It's growth. So now you're at the top, you're at the top, but then you're at the bottom, meaning you're in a different echelon and you're going to keep on going up and down, up and down. And I can just say when I started in like 20, 10 years ago, I was reading all these sales books and I'm interviewing the authors now <laughs> and having which is you know, amazing. conversations. And I'm just like, <laughs> you were my idol, like, you know, 10 years ago and now we're, you know, on the same show. So it's just like, you earn the right to, to get there. And I think it's also, yeah, that's part of it. I think if there is imposter syndrome, just look at some of the activities you're doing and saying like, there's, you're the only one that sees this because you, you have every right to be here. And if you weren't able to write a book or couldn't get it published, you wouldn't have, but you did. Yeah. 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 And it is amazing because yeah. And then you look back five years ago, it was like a very far away dream to me to write a book Mm -hmm. three years ago. I was just getting started. Yeah. And so, you know, like that's huge in, in that amount of time. I mean, day to day, it feels like, ah, you're never going to get something done or, you know, you have a deadline or all of those things. But, you know, then when you look back, you're like, okay, look what I did in, in that amount of time also. Right. So that is where like breaking that journey down into small digestible pieces and taking the time to look back is really important because then you get more perspective about what you've actually been able to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as a writer, you can attest to that, having to sit Mm -hmm. down every day and having your writing time. Those are the small incremental steps. And I would imagine even the days that you don't want to. Absolutely. Five days a week, I sat down and wrote. So that's how the book got done. Only for, uh, you know, for the most part, for only an hour a day. Yeah. But, you know, if you put some some parameters around things, it's amazing what you can get done. Yeah, no, totally. And one last thing is just, you know, when you said celebrate, I would say no one's going to celebrate you more than you. And so if you're waiting for other one, like, and you feel guilty or embarrassed to celebrate your successes or where you've c- come from, no one else is going to do it for you. So go out and <laughs> buy yourself dinner, buy yourself something, give yourself a pat on the back, because honestly, like that's you're not going to have that stamina to move forward if you're constantly chasing out. It's it's like running. It's like take a race, take a breath, take a drink, and just go like, yeah, you did it. And then allow that to propel you to the next floor. Otherwise, you're just chasing and you're tired. Yes. Yeah, you've got to take a – you've got – and what is that thing that, you know, yeah, is it having lunch with a friend, going for a walk? Is mm-hmm. it, you know, what are the what are the things that feel like a reward to you? And yeah, how do you make sure you build them in? Is it taking half a day off work to go and look around and do something you would never do? Like whatever that might look like, you know, do it because you've got to, you've got to find ways to sustain your energy for the long game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, Julie, you've, uh, you've been a, a great insight here on goals and just the mindset required and even the resilience from starting, you know, Mabel's Labels in a, in a basement in Hamilton <laughs> to growing it and scaling it and then writing a book. So I imagine there's going to be people that would love to connect with you and, um, and perhaps follow you. So if, if there are, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, two ways. You can find me at biggorgeousgoals.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn at Julie Ellis. Okay. And so we will include all those in the show notes as well as the link for Big Gorgeous Goals. So I encourage you all to go purchase it, especially at this time of the year, where you can go and get in front of those 2023 goals and um, 
and, and start working away towards achieving them. So thank you so much, Julie. And uh, it's great seeing you. Thanks, Karen. Great talking with you today.